the sort of second set of slides is, is really throwing open the debate around reopening services. And I think there are a, a number of scenarios around that. I, you know, we've heard stories of a number of programmes that have shut completely and staff have been deployed elsewhere or people have deemed it uh, inappropriate to continue. So we have, you know, this, uh, that, this idea of reopening after a complete closure. I think we've also got some centres that have, have tried very hard to maintain some type of service, um, but did offer non-direct uh, contact programmes. So we have now the opportunity where we can move towards doing these face-to-face -face assessments, or some services may continue to do no face-to-face -face assessments and look for alternative approaches around that. And then finally, there's this challenge or opportunity or op opportunity and challenge, I guess, around opening up conventional pulmonary rehabilitation programmes in a way that we are all very much more familiar with. And of course, there is BTS guidance available on this, um, very specifically uh, focusing on procedural issues, infection control, social distancing around the centre base rehabilitation programs and they would largely follow uh, the guidance that we've already talked about with respect to COVID in terms of uh, managing the population spacing etc and uh, cleaning equipment after every session. So I think some of the challenges that we have around um, delivering pulmonary rehabilitation particularly the face-to-face -face component is is this face-to-face -face assessment and we know that the BTS quality standards for pulmonary rehabilitation clearly state that the program should include a measure of exercise capacity, quality of life and dyspnea as a minimum. Now of course I'm sure many of us have actually been doing uh, telephone assessments and of course you can measure quality of life and breathlessness over the phone, that, that's, that's not difficult. Um, it may alter the results slightly, but, but actually as long as we do that in a standardised way, that is certainly a good second best. But there are some challenges in terms of delivering the programme in terms of space and staffing and PPE and patients willingness to attend uh, for a rehabilitation program. Whilst we were in, in lockdown or the depths of lockdown, we um, offered patients a variety of uh, packages of care to support them and actually some people were desperate to wait until we started opening up our face-to-face -face programs again and wanted to sort of suspend their membership as it were um, until we were opening up again. This is just a picture across the top of our, our COVID group but you can see that all the, the staff are wearing um, clear PPE, aprons, gloves, masks, visors and the patients are just wearing masks and that's exactly what it looks like now in terms of um, our COPD or chronic lung disease group as well and we have you can just see in the back we have uh, three pieces of exercise equipment but we would only use one of those at any one time rather than uh, moving everything around the gym so we have modified the program and people try and stay um, in, in a certain space as well. So I just thought I'd discuss some of the BTS guidance and this is around exercise testing and there was a lot of debate around this very early on uh, really before we all started considering doing exercise tests and suggested that um, exercise testing which of course includes field-based exercise tests that we are all familiar with were not classified as uh, aerosol generating procedures but we did have to follow guidance around that in terms of social distancing, um, managing the flow of patients through the uh, assessment facilities and making sure there was a, you know, a single direction of flow of patients and no patients overlapped etc and the rooms were cleaned in between times. Um, change of air flow in line with local policy and that's quite interesting. I'm not 100% sure that I really understand what that means and, and certainly on a very practical level we just keep as many doors open and windows open as we can um, and we all wear the full PPE when we're doing it, any assessment and actually during uh, the rehabilitation programme as well not only in terms of PPE um, and, and managing infection control but also if you, if you have to get um, 
much closer to people because there's an adverse event in the middle of the class as well. Not that that routinely happens in rehab, but clearly we have to be prepared for that. So I thought I'd talk a little bit because this is quite a controversial area in terms of what exercise test can, can we do or should we be doing. Now, in the national audit, there are two exercise tests that are used. One is the six minute walking test, which we referred to in the uh, COVID literature, which is uh, simply conducted up and down a corridor and the incremental shuttle walking tests, which are um, done in a much shorter space, but, but have, are incremental in, in, in nature and stress an individual to this symptom limited maximum. Now in the guidance, they were considered to be the most appropriate to assess one desaturation, which is important in the COPD population and arguably uh, very important in the COVID population. Um, and they allow an effective exercise prescription. So there are some challenges uh, around that in terms of using other exercise tests. People have been very keen to explore doing exercise tests that can potentially be conducted at home, such as the one minute sit to stand or a step test. Um, and there's a general feeling that there is, there is uh, uh, some concern around how you um, would conduct those safely and how you would prescribe exercise from them effectively. There's no literature to, to suggest how you would actually do that. And that is the fundamental component of pulmonary rehabilitation. And there's no evidence reporting the feasibility or safety of conducting these tests in the patient's home, or there wasn't at the time of, of writing. Now, there has been a, a study conducted by Anne Holland, who's um, a physiotherapist in Australia, who also contributed to the ATS uh, ERS statements, uh, sorry, consensus um, guidance on pulmonary rehabilitation in the recovery phase. And they looked at all of the tests that you could potentially do at, in a home environment and looked at some of the evidence around those. And they found uh, evidence that a six minute walking tests had been conducted at home, six stand tests, step tests, and timed up and go. Um, one of the concerns was that there, there, was, there, was, there were no studies where these hadn't been done with a healthcare professional in the home. So to try and manage this situation remotely with video conferencing would, would certainly be very novel. Um, and reinforce really what the BTS document said that uh, these, these tests that can be performed at home, um, obviously the, the step tests, timed up and go tests, if, if patients have sufficient room, but again, don't accurately document desaturation uh, with walking or allow exercise prescription. Um, and they suggested that those people that are at risk of desaturation should be prioritised for a centre-based exercise test when, when this became available. And on the theme of, of telemedicine and video conferencing, I think we've seen a really interesting development of all sorts of um, different types of rehabilitation programmes that have been offered. And of course, it's very tempting to think that something is, is better than, than nothing. And for many people, it may well be, but of course, you know, the evidence for some of these alternative approaches is, is not overwhelming at the moment. And I thought I'd just bring to everyone's attention this paper that was in Thorax earlier, earlier this year uh, and published pre-COVID pre that looked at uh, tele-rehabilitation versus centre-based rehabilitation. So, we, we've seen uh, certainly anecdotal reports of people delivering classes um, over Zoom, uh, potentially um, in a variety of formats. So this was a population that was randomised to the, either the uh, video conferencing group-based rehabilitation or conventional uh, centre-based pulmonary rehabilitation. And these are just the um, three interesting outcome measures that they reported. The six minute walking test was the primary outcome. And you can see that um, for those of you that would use the six minute walking test, these distances aren't terribly different to the types of distances we would see in pulmonary rehabilitation programmes in the UK. But there was very little difference uh, post rehabilitation of, of either mode, which is fascinating because 
very commonly you would expect to see a change in the conventional pulmonary rehabilitation program but for this study that was adequately powered to detect a difference they found no difference at all so whilst you would say that there was no difference between pulmonary rehabilitation and uh, offered in a center compared to video conferencing they've both failed it I mean, it's largely a negative study you can see that the cat on the bottom left hand side that improved slightly after rehabilitation and that the magnitude of change was similar for both groups and the bottom right hand so side shows physical activity uh, measured with an activity monitor rather alarmingly you can see that in the pulmonary rehabilitation group there was quite a rapid <laughs> decline in physical activity and um, that was also observed but to a lesser extent in in the telehealth group as well so as, as of um, January this year that the evidence was certainly not overwhelming for uh, telehealth delivered in this way for patients with uh, quite severe chronic lung disease but I, th I don't think the population was terribly different to that that we might see in, in a UK service. I think what, what's been useful, and I hope we get some data from this, is that the national audit has continued throughout lockdown and there has been the facility to enter data. And we added um, a drop down box so that if no exercise test was conducted, which was fairly obvious during the depths of, of lockdown, that you could still enter the other data that you'd secured um, over the telephone, for example, you know, the CAT or the CRQ or the MRC, you would be able to enter those as, as normal um, into the, the data set. We've always had the option since the revised uh, data set to add in other forms of rehabilitation. So it does allow you for each patient to catalogue how rehabilitation was delivered, how many contacts they had, whether it was centre based or home based. And if it was home based, was it uh, supported over the telephone with video conferencing or web based programs? So I would really encourage everybody to, um, if they can, retrospectively enter the, enter the data and certainly prospectively, you know, re-engage with the national audit because it would be a very rich data set to explore at a at a level, clearly not as comprehensively as we would like to, but at least it gives us some feel or what might have been happening with these alternative modes of delivery. So I, I was just asked as a, a sort of closing statement to comment on what, what's been happening at UHL. Uh, we've talked about the post COVID-19 rehabilitation classes. Now, interestingly, when we started that, it was a cohort and now we've had permission to move to a rolling program, but What's fascinating is that our dropout rate is, large, is zero at the moment. I mean, clearly we haven't got a vast experience, but the commitment of patients post COVID to come to rehabilitation exceeds that, that we, we observed or have traditionally observed in uh, patients that would come for pulmonary rehab. During lockdown, we offered telephone assessments. So we obviously were able to do the subjective assessment and collect some questionnaire data. And then we offered different forms of rehab. So that would be um, a digital platform with the space for COPD website or the space for COPD home-based manual. Um, and we've had those for an awfully long time. And it's been fascinating to see how uh, people have chosen now to do, to do different modes, different centers have, have, have become more interested in different ways of delivering things. Um, and now we're able to offer virtual assessments, but that's become fairly recent because the whole hospital had to go through this system of approving uh, these video conferencing consultations and clearly pulmonary rehab wasn't quite at the top of that list to be added and certainly adding in group facilities seemed to be uh, another layer of complication. And then of course, as I mentioned earlier, we, we've had um, people that have chosen to delay their rehabilitation until face-to-face uh, -face is available. So currently we're now opening up our pulmonary rehabilitation and our cardiac rehabilitation, but they're not integrated with the post-COVID uh, patients. We do hybrid assessments, so we do as much as we can over the telephone and then do face-to-face uh, -face exercise tests and then 
uh, invite people to pursue whichever option they would like, be it space for CAPD website or the home based manual, or indeed come for the face to face programme. And initially, again, as with COVID, this will be run on, on a cohort basis. So I think in, in summary, um, talking about COVID as well, I think there's an emerging demand for a recovery and rehabilitation programme. And I think there's an exciting opportunity for pulmonary rehabilitation, but I think that assuming that pulmonary rehabilitation is the answer for the, for the COVID patients is not quite right. I think, you know, it, it's, it's probably better than nothing, but as not as comprehensive as it might be. But I think we also need to protect the programmes that we do have, not let them be overrun by the COVID population. And, and in some ways, there's a, there is a threat to delivering pulmonary rehabilitation in the way that we know it. I think that those of us that are used to delivering high quality rehabilitation programmes should, should actively seek to reprovide that as soon as possible so that we can guarantee a high quality service for patients. But of course, evaluate alternatives to absolutely increase engagement and uptake for patients with the conventional chronic respiratory diseases. Thank you very much, Sally. That was um, a wonderful overview of, of the data, the evidence, both for post-COVID and for returning to face-to-face. -to -face. And I think a lot of clinicians will be really, really helped by knowing what you're doing at, uh, at Glenfield at University Hospitals of Leicester, because you're considered the byword. And obviously, as someone who's involved in creating the guidance, it's quite important that we understand what you do. In light of the, the knowledge that you are a tertiary centre with, with quite a large space and um, as you mentioned before in the post-COVID you've got the facility of, of a hospital attached to you which not everyone does. Um, so there are questions I know that clinicians will want answers to and uh, is also related to commissioning and that's of course about numbers. So the guidance that we read about is a uh, maximum of, of six people indoors at one time with an exemption if you're there for work. So I assume the same rule has applied. Yeah. Yes. So we, we've applied exactly the same rule and, and, and I think the reality is in the, certainly the space we have in Leicester, we wouldn't be able to get more than six in anyway, observing the social distancing. We have a facility in Loughborough um, at the university and it's, I mean, it is a wonderful space and we could comfortably get more than six in there, but we don't because of the, because of the rules at the moment. Mm. And, and, and a lot of people have smaller spaces. So it was nice seeing your gym so people can get a sense that six plus staff. And is that two staff at any one time? Yeah, yeah, we would have, we, you know, we stick to the, the conventional guidance of, you know, one to eight, but a minimum of, of two. Um, you know, and we have people in that, that come and observe so they can see how we're doing and learn from us. You know, ju just different teams around the hospital, they come in. So, um, so occasionally there's more than that, but there's only two staff working, <laughs> as it were. Um, but it, 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 is, it is quite challenging, really. Mm. Um, and I think the gym that we have is a nice gym, um, but I can imagine smaller, smaller facilities, it, it really does become quite hard to, to manage the, the demand and the flow. And there's a lot of concern from individual clinicians about uh, the cost effectiveness. You know, if they can only get four patients in a room, but they need two staff as well. Um, and it's going to take, so there's the, the, the cost efficiency, but there's also the wait lists will grow and grow. And so one, one thought is, and I don't know what you think about it. So one of our providers had a very interesting suggestion to have a face-to-face -face once a week and a virtual session once a week to make the two sessions. I don't know if you'd like to comment on that idea. I, th I think that's interesting. I mean, I, but for me, the most important part is getting the assessment right. And I think we've always, as a community, been very reluctant to offer people alternative forms of rehab. So, um, you know, there are other forms of home-based rehab that, that there is a little bit of literature that, that work so in terms of a manual approach or a web-based approach and certainly yeah, we, we offer virtual now and I've had quite a few conversations with people that our uptake so far has been zero so I think that 
if you are digitally active, there are probably other mechanisms by which you, you know, if somebody was digitally active and engaged, I would offer them an exclusive digital program. And somebody that wasn't, I would offer them conventional rehab. I wouldn't try and mix and match because I think the majority of people, certainly in our experience, and I've been talking to other colleagues around the country, actually down in London, Julia, were saying that, you know, these people that, that then, they're not as digitally engaged as we think. And we saw that from Claire Nolan's report very early on in COVID. That, so I, I think there's a, a, you know, we've just got to find the balance. I think it's great that people are developing things. And I'm sure for some people, they are brilliant. Um, but I think that we have to offer people a, a fair and equitable choice and not force people down a digital route when they're not digitally competent. And, and indeed, that was borne out. Funnily enough, I saw on, on Twitter today a, a poster from the PCRS that's running. And um, although something like 146 patients actually had access to, to digital um, yeah. software, only about half of those mm -hmm. agreed to try a digital yeah. platform. Yeah. And it shows the lack. And, and the re main reason was lack of confidence. So I think that's yeah. a, a, a really important point for us to to take away isn't it and and think creatively i think we have to think creatively and not try and shoehorn everybody into this digital pathway mm. so you know I, I i i i suspect commissioners are you know the danger is isn't it that that commissioners will see um you know twitter or whatever these these reports of where people have been offering virtual rehab and we have no idea really how effective they are no um, but if they see them, they'll, you know, the, the absolute worry is they'll think that's rehab and yes. they commission that. Instead. Instead. So I, so I think as a community, whilst it's important to innovate, we have to protect what we know works as well. Mm, interesting point, because I think before we all had to do it in lockdown, everyone assumed that virtual was much more time efficient. You could get hundreds of patients doing it virtually and you could sort of manage them from a central point. And in fact, the reality that, that I'm hearing from clinicians is it's very time consuming to offer it virtually because of the time to explain it, support patients and so on. Is that your experience too? Have very little experience because we've had nobody take it up <laughs> you know so despite the fact that we have a you know the enthusiasm within the team people are reluctant to do it. we've had more uptake for the web-based program and of course the home-based program um which you know so the, the advantage of the web is that people whilst people aren't generally going anywhere it's they can do it at a time that suits them whereas if you've obviously got a, a, a virtual class then you're again fixed to this time. Not that I think that's a real problem for most people, but I, th I think it's interesting. Mm. No, well, that is interesting. Uh, around safety in the home as well. So, you know, I've had some interesting conversations with the British Geriatric Society and I would, I suspect it's all on their website, but they, they are very concerned about trips and falls and um, mm -hmm. people being asked to do things locally and, and, and falling over so I think there's something around how, how do we ensure patient safety as well yes and of course we've got this this trade-off that if people sit at home and do nothing then they're likely to get yeah. weak and lose core muscle and balance and they're likely to fall yeah. anyway so we need to do something to keep them strong and and practicing balance yeah no, exactly yeah. so I think it's, it's it's a real challenge and I think that you know, you're sort of inevitably caught between a rock and a hard place in a way mm. that we're assuming that something is, is better than nothing. But mm. we don't want that something to be defined as rehab going forwards and, you know, losing the foundation of what we know works and offers a high quality service for patients. Mm. I think that's the real worry. Mm. And if we're too uh, evangelical about all this virtual work that we've all been doing, I think it'll undermine rehab. Yes, interesting point, Sally. And and you you showed us your lovely gym and the equipment and the and the spacing and you talked about only one person using the equipment where there's a row of bikes, for example, you'd only have one person. And again, a big debate. So the guidance is that that equipment shouldn't be shared between patients in one session, even if you clean it between patients. And is that do you think that that is imperative? 
um, or, or if it's cleaned carefully, someone could use the bike and move away and someone else could move on to it if it was if it was cleaned or would you adhere to only cleaning it after the session after one patient has used it at the moment we have a, a big clean after each session and i think that's practically easier to manage because you then know what's been cleaned and what hasn't been cleaned and you do a good job i think you know i went to, to the gym and, and clearly it, it, it's it's very light touch in terms of how public gyms are managing their cleaning on the whole and as an individual you would take you know you would i would imagine choose to take responsibility for cleaning your own equipment rather than relying on anybody else to do it so i think it's quite clunky so yeah. we've chosen at the moment to have a, a sort of a post gym cleaning session and only one patient using one piece of equipment per session yeah. so being creative yeah. and getting getting people doing perhaps different things to normal so that they haven't all got to use the bike. I think that's right, and then, you know, rotating that around so the next time somebody comes in, they would use a different piece of equipment. Yeah. So I think it is, it is definitely you know, thought-provoking, but, but doable. And this is where the community services are running it from a church hall or something have the advantage because there isn't any equipment. <laughs> so no, you haven't got that, you know, give everyone a piece of resistive band and a chair and that's your lot, really. Exactly. So I, so I think in some ways that that makes it easier. Mm. Um, yes. You know, what you have to do, is do you? So as long as, you know, you can maintain patient safety, then then there's no reason why you wouldn't carry on with that. And I have one more question. I'm aware that time is running out. Um, I know that some of the clinicians in our region have, have tried the space web program uh, with their patients. And there is concern because of the BTS standard of, of twice weekly supervised that in the space web program, the patient is given a call in week one and then again in, in week four. So does that mean that they're not actually getting two supervised sessions a week and therefore they're not meeting the standards and that that isn't pulmonary rehab no i think i think you're, you're right they do get two calls because we recognize that um for all the reasons that you've just said you're trying to monitor classes and replicating a home program a hospital program at home that becomes hugely time consuming and, and co absolutely cost ineffective so that you might imagine if you had to phone obviously when you're in a class you're with eight other patients so you're you know they all get one eighth of you whereas when you're doing a call patient you know you're in a one-to-one -one relationship mm -hmm. and so it's hugely expensive so when we developed this package it was really to look at something that might be cost effective and arguably you know i think it's difficult isn't it because you 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 know one approach um which i have some sympathy be, with would be to say that it's the outcome that's important not how you got there yeah um and i think you know what we're not sophisticated enough to know is is which patient gets the best response from which well First of all, we, there aren't, there's not much choice. There's, there's the study that we did with the manual that was fully powered. So you'd have to believe that data. There's Anne Holland study in Canada. So you'd have to believe that data. And there's this telemedicine trial that's been published that was fully powered as well. So there's not overwhelming data in terms of equivalence trials for different forms of intervention. So I, th I think we, we do have limited options um but i think it's beholden to all of us to try and accumulate that evidence and then when we have this body of evidence we should be able to say um, you know fred with these characteristics is probably likely to do well with this program and then you have some discussion with them and have some shared decision making around that and i think that you know we have a way to go before we get there but that's where we should be striving because clearly one size doesn't doesn't fit all in terms of uh, a, a rehabilitation intervention not at all and and this is where ai could possibly be of a tremendous help to us with um calculating who is going to respond to which kind of service 
So Sally, thank you so much. Um, I think uh, on behalf of myself and uh, all our audience in the AHSN, uh, thank you for a really interesting couple of, couple of to topics on the same subject as pulmonary rehab. Been lovely to have you. Pleasure, Julia.